Sounds like a plan. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast, Open Mic Night. We are thrilled to have with us tonight an attorney that is probably the bell of the ball when you talk about the note investing world. Um, Franco Borelli is from the firm of Sotilli and Borelli, and they are based in Ohio, but licensed in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and now Illinois for those of us brave enough to venture into Illinois for our deals. Um, welcome, Frank. You. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have so many questions about the shifting uh, legal landscape in Ohio and Indiana. I actually didn't even realize it's shifting that much in Indiana. Um, uh, Chris is such an avid follower of all things legal that he, you know, frightens me on a daily basis about all the new and terrible things that are <laughs> that are underway. But um, so we mostly have asked you here to talk about some of the new things that we all need to know about. But we also have quite a large group of our regular listeners from Thursday nights who I think would love to have some time to ask you questions at the end too. So if you would. Could you please start out and just let us know a little bit about your firm and about how you've been serving note investors all these many years? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Chris, for having me on. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm the partner of Sotillian Barilli. My, my other partner's Tony, and uh, we got together in 2015. Uh, we, we had a, a mindset of doing bankruptcy and collections. Uh, Tony was very good at, on the bankruptcy side. I was very good on the collection side. Uh, between the two of us, we had extensive years of uh, foreclosures, forfeitures, and, and, and doc preparation on the real estate side. So as we built the firm on our bankruptcy and collection practice, we started back into the real estate world probably in about 2016. And uh, as we started that, uh, it has grown uh, enormously. And uh, I, think, I think what's helped too is, you know, with, with a, a law firm and attorneys, sometimes it's hard to get them. And at times, it's probably hard to get Tony and I as well. Uh, but we try to respond as quick as possible, and uh, with our experience, we we cover a, a good swath of that Midwest where you can come to our firm, and if you're in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, and Michigan, you, you know, you've got a one-stop shop, and, and we can do it all. So we Yeah, your states are really CFD heaven. Um, do you find that most of the work that you do is contracts for deed as opposed to conventional notes? Yeah, so the conventional notes we'll see on the institutional side. On the investor side, we'll see quite a bit of the CFDs. Uh, but as we talk a little further tonight, I know you, you mentioned Indiana, um, Ohio. Ohio is going to be your state where things um, not only are changing, I, I think they're just, they're going to change. And yeah, I've they, been they, railing they, about, I've been railing against Ohio really for like two years before <laughs> they even did anything. I just had a thing about them. <laughs> You're the only thing good about Ohio. You and Bill Greesmer, as far as, great. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, as, that's it. As, as I always say, you know, I say Ohio stands for only headaches in Ohio. So <laughs> hey, it's not bad. <laughs> hey, Franco, I did have one quick question. though. I know yeah. sometimes on your website it mentions like Wisconsin, like your federal. Is that bankruptcy or what? What is that in some of these? Yes. Areas? So that's the bankruptcy side. You can add Wisconsin. Uh, the District of Columbia, and I believe it's Colorado as well. So whatever's on the website there, those are the, the additional states where we can do uh, federal bankruptcy uh, uh, court work. Now, my partner, Tony's also created a, a national bankruptcy site as well. So if anybody need a proof of claim in any jurisdiction in the United States, he's created a department that, that solely does that work. So um, if there is a proof of claim needed or certain other documents. Uh, if you guys want to do that, like a bankruptcy 101, he's your guy. We could do that again as well. Yeah. Uh, but he's, you know, he, he's created such a big department um, that, that he's really seen that national side of, of bankruptcy work really take off. It's a, it's a nice niche. You know, if you need a proof of claim, you've got yeah. our Definitely. Bankruptcy. So let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. What do you charge for a proof of claim? <laughs> I have to get Tony on the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where is he? Anyway, he's never around when you need him. Yeah, we should probably give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, so I thought a proof of claim was a fairly simple document. The first time I saw one, it was like 30 pages. Is that normal or is that just lawyers proving their worth? No. <laughs> well, you know, these are, the, you consider them as typical forms, but when you're 
getting them done by a law firm, uh, especially like Tony and, and his people, that they have um, all the experience in all these jurisdictions to know some of the small things that some of these courts require. Yeah. Uh, so the forms in, in and of themselves are pretty standard. However, there are certain nuances in each of those jurisdictions that you have to watch out for. So that's why we, with Tony marketing that side of it, that's, that's the true marketing side is you can do it yourself, but if you do it wrong, it's kind of hard to go back and, and fix that. Yeah, I don't know what Ohio's actual motto is, but it should be something along the line of like the quagmire or quicksand of every, you know, good business. Because um, I'm aware, although I don't buy in Ohio, that the deeds in Ohio, unlike any other state, strict requirements on the margins on the yeah. deeds. You have to write down the prior deed registration date of recording, instrument number. I mean, they are just looking for ways to like mess you up, are they not? I mean, it, Yeah, they are. I mean, there, there's a, quite a bit you have to put inside these deeds. And, and I, I think Michigan's a little tough too in getting the, the deeds all formatted. They, I think a lot of states have their standard formats. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Ohio requires quite a bit. And what the, they do is that the clerks, the, the actual recorder's office, um, they really, I don't want to say nitpick, but they, they find some errors and they ship it back. And, you know, yeah, I picture them with their rulers, you know, <laughs> three inch margin on the first page, the top. I, I had one rejected in Michigan because the company that created the deed, the individual uses their initials, then their last name. They rejected it because they don't allow somebody to use their initials. So the person used, you know, um, CJ, Smith and you know they rejected it because he has to put like Charles J Smith I mean something like that that they sent it back for yeah and you got to be careful too with those previous deeds you have to you have to match them so the grantee of that previous deed must match the the new grantor of the deed yeah. well so, that, that was just the person who was creating it you know in the upper left hand corner oh my goodness okay it says, please return to this person that's where it was not the actual transfer of the person's name but the person who was creating the document because wow. i use you know i use orion metasource out of texas um sure. so this person down there who uses his initials on everything and yeah he um you know they rejected it because of that <laughs> oh gee. yeah that's that's i i would call that rare but if it's happening to you that's i guess it's not so rare yeah it seems like i mean it varies a little county by county right i mean yep. I don't know for sure, but I assume that Cuyahoga County is like way more difficult than a lot of people. For me, it's easy because we get to drive there and if there's any errors, we can fix them right there. Oh, so it's a little easier. <laughs> Very so, interesting. Speaking of Ohio, Franco, why don't we roll into some of the new <laughs> things that are going on in some, some of our favorite states because I know there's some big changes going on in Ohio, especially with uh, contract for deeds. Yeah, so there was a, a bill in committee, and I, I want to say it started in 2017. It was a, a very low-level committee. Um, uh, uh, somebody within the, the state senate said, let's bring this up. Let's at least try to fix contract for deeds. And what ended up happening is uh, it kind of got stalled. And it, the stalling, it kind of picked up steam when there were some issues in Cincinnati. And uh, the city of Cincinnati passed an ordinance that pretty much mirrored that bill that was put forward in, in the Ohio legislature in, in that committee. So uh, it was a bipartisan bill now. And they came up and said, you know what? We don't want to allow Cincinnati or Youngstown to create ordinances. We want to have a state law. So they got a bill together, a bipartisan bill, and that finally went through. So that I think it started in, in March or April. It was put into the house and it's slowly making its way up. Uh, I do believe at the end of the summer, maybe beginning of fall, that bill is going to pass. And what it really does is it, it, it sort of eliminates land contracts or the reason to do them. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you, you might as well lease the property and just do it as a, a tenancy because what it does is the uh, owner of the property who's giving that land contract for seller financing that owner has to pay for property taxes, has to pay for insurance. They have to get an inspection before uh, giving a land contract to any subsequent borrower. They must go to the city to make sure there's no violations. And there are so many different things that need to be done that eliminates the reason to do them. Land contracts were good because it helped the borrower secure home ownership 
in a short period of time that they couldn't secure with a, a, a traditional lender. And I, I think that's, that's just going to go away. Uh, they're capping interest rates. They're doing a lot. There is no provision yet regarding retroactivity. So all of the land contracts that are, that are in place now, these sh these, this new law shouldn't apply, but we don't know yet until that bill passes. And I saw some provisions within that new update that makes me believe they might make portions of it retroactive. So there's something to watch out for. And I, I really think the reason they, they tried and they did it in Cincinnati because there was a certain lender down there that had a lot of land contracts and, and the legislature believed that they were duping the borrowers. And if you actually look at the land contracts, they, they look pretty standard. They look okay. It, it's just, I think it became a problem with um, uh, that area and it, things just blew up. And I think from that, you know, the state said, let's create something that's going to protect the whole state. So it's interesting, Franco, because, you know, you and I, um, in some of these land contracts and you came back to me where I was going to do a cancellation and basically redo the land contract because one of the things I would do sometimes is reset that five-year clock or the 20% interest uh, down payment. Uh, I believe they call that the Chris 70 move. Like you do that at times. <laughs> <even better. laughs> so, you know, that, I mean, that basically you mentioned that pretty much putting something in place today on a land contract, you wouldn't advise it. Um, or if you did, you'd want to follow that rule. So that kind of throws that out. So you were mentioning, you quickly touch upon it, a lease option. Do you want to just explain to some people on here what a lease option is? Sure. It's, it's a, um, it's two separate documents. So you have your standard lease and I'm sure you've seen enough leases in your days. Uh, and then there's a separate option to purchase. And what that option to purchase does is it gives that tenant, literally an option to purchase at a later date. You will put a date in there. Sometimes it's a five year term. You can take a down payment and you can decide whether that down payment applies to that purchase price, let's say in five years, or it's just considered a, a payment towards the option. And then they can also use those lease payments towards that purchase price. So what it does is you don't record the lease and you have the same rules as a landlord um, using a lease with, with an option to purchase. Again, you know, you're, you own the property, so you have to pay for taxes, you have to pay for insurance, uh, you have to make sure you maintain the property, you, you become a landlord. So if you understand the, the responsibilities of a landlord, that's what a lease with an option to purchase would do. Can you- okay, so I'm sorry, can I just- Go ahead. <laughs> I have a question too, go ahead. So Franco, in the past, there's always been sort of the law and then the contract that you write and you were able to put things in a contract and as long as someone agreed to them, it didn't matter if they followed the letter of like the law, but, that, but that's really what we're saying is happening here. There's no more flexibility to write contracts that oh, they're go yes. the borrower yeah. to pay the no. taxes and the insurance. No, they're gone. The, the one final provision in that bill is if the borrower is represented by an attorney, you can waive some of the provisions. So that's, that's your saving grace, but how many borrowers are gonna get an attorney to get into a land contract? And that maybe could be the, the push for the borrower. If the borrower wants to do a land contract, you can tell them, well, you know what? If you can go see an attorney, we'll, we'll do one for you. Huh. And then you can kind of negotiate a little more. So two questions, Franco. On the lease option, do the payments on the lease have to go towards, do, you know, by law, do they, have, do they go towards paying down that amount or could it be kept separate? And I'm guessing that question popped through is that you have to put a pr few, uh, price on that lease option of you have so many years to buy it at this price. Yeah, that option gives you the exact purchase price of that, that house. Okay. So you, you have the option to purchase it at a certain time. So it's, the clock runs on a certain date and then it ends on a certain date. In between that time, the tenant has an option to purchase it. And standard in those contracts is the lease payments will apply towards that purchase price. Mm -hmm. um, that down payment doesn't have to, but mm -hmm. those lease payments normally standard do. Okay, so those lease payments are in essence an interest-free loan or can they represent an interest rate also? Yeah, no interest rate would be put on that. So it would basically be like, say you had 50 months to buy something, you had a thousand a month. And you wanted the price to be fifty thousand at the end of the day. You'd have the 
lease option be a hundred thousand because if they made the fifty payments at a thousand at the end of the day, it's um, fifty thousand. Correct? Is that kind of how? Yeah, and, and I believe you can also portion some of that le those lease payments as well. But at least you have to be able to portion some to that purchase price. And and again, you know, you're looking at um, at at ideas that are, I mean, they're they're not what you would want to do. You know, I mean, it's with with a land contract, you're giving that borrower the right to own the property, equitable right to own the property. So they'll take care of the property. You know, they wouldn't call you for any maintenance issues because they are supposed to take care of that property. With a lease, even with an option to purchase, you also have to make sure that you are taking care of that property. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's for landlords. When you talk about, you know, notes and mortgages and, and note buying, that's usually a, a separate world from being a landlord. Right, so the only advantage of a lease purchase option over a lease where you're never going to give it to them is that you get the down payment, right? Yeah, you can, obviously that's, that would be the point of getting that down payment. Um, and you know, that, that can be negotiated how much down you want to consider taking. Right. But if you're just never going to make anything on this other than the down payment, like, right. And, and you're, like, you're why looking, sell it to them at all, you know, just, right. It's a rental. <laughs> it's a re exactly. And that option of purchase is, you know, again, it's, you get a down payment, you wouldn't get that in a lease. You know, a lease you would just pick in a, a security deposit, which applies at a lease, and then the monthly payments. With that option of purchase, you're, you're telling that tenant to put more money down. And you can, they can put considerable money down. But again, that's something that, um, again, does not have to apply towards that purchase price. And that's why it's, it's something that's it's for the use of the option. You know, for something that's supposed to be protective, legislation for borrowers i mean that seems insane because if you can have people put a big chunk of money down and it doesn't buy them any equity in the in the property like and then they fail to pay their rent you know three months down the line like isn't that predatory to have taken a bunch of money from somebody right from the get-go right and that's again the, the, the laws are changing so quickly so i think they're going to land contracts i you know i think Leases have been obviously around for a long time. The lease with an option has been around for a long time. Obviously, land contracts have been around for a long time. Um, but I think a lot of things are changing, and they're starting to really change on, on the land contract side in Ohio. And that's, you know, I, I think that bill is going to pass, and when it does, it's going to be difficult for people to enter into those contracts. Yeah, do you think once they realize that people are using this as the workaround, that they will then start even making more rules about lease options as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that they're going to eventually go around to that. Uh, and we'll see if, if this bill doesn't pass for whatever reason, then you, you, you know, obviously you won't have to worry about it because they're making a big push towards it. Uh, but Cincinnati, you know, the city of Cincinnati already has rules regarding land contracts. So, you know, you move outside of Cincinnati, you don't have to worry about it. But you go into Cincinnati, you do. Mm -hmm. Very strange. And that's, I think, why they wanted to put this bill together and try to get it passed. So two things I'll mention is like for lease options, you know, the only time I would consider it and when I have considered it is if you have a contract for deed now that may have to go through a foreclosure process and instead of spending five to six grand to foreclose and you really don't want to do a mod, you want to try and reset the clock on something, then you can say, hey, look, let's cancel land contract. I'll give you a lease option, which still gives you the option to buy it in a few years, which is really the workaround for it, but you're right, most people aren't going to, you know, do a lease option, they'd rather just lease it or whatnot. The other question I was going to ask Franco is, you know, has anyone brought up the point that, you know, most banks don't lend it under 50 grand in Ohio is not cheap to foreclose on. So nobody, it's going to turn into nobody's going to have home ownership on properties under 50 grand. Investors are probably going to love it because the rent is probably going to skyrocket with this um, because people can't get mortgages. And, it's you know going to allow the investors to you know really jack up the rent. Yeah, there, there's always consequences of what you know can can come from a bill, and uh, I, I don't know if they worry about those things. I, I think they look at one side of it and get the bill out there. It looks good, um, you know, to the outside world of you know they're trying to make sure everybody can live in a home and not have to worry about predatory lending. So we're looking at <laughs> yeah, they, can't, they can't buy it at all. basically. Yeah. That's, you know, it's going to be a little more difficult, but I think, and it is, it's, if you see some of these land contracts, you know, they, they were really based, they were intended to be short term. So you're looking at five years. And when, when I used to uh, review these land contracts back in, in 2009, 2010, 
they all had a five-year term, every single one of them. At the end of five years, they couldn't make their payments. You know, you, re you release the land contract and, and they're on their way or they get a deed and they get refinanced and they're able to buy the house. Right. So, I, you know, seeing these land contracts 20, 30 years out, you know, that's, that's, I don't think it was intended that way. And they look like notes and mortgages, but you know, yeah, it, isn't, it is. isn't that because, I mean, I don't think anyone really anticipated after the crash in 2008 that it would be so ridiculously difficult to get a loan, you know, like, right. It used to be before the crash, every part of the crash was that anybody with a pulse could get a loan. But now, you know, you need a pulse and a hundred thousand dollars to get a fifty thousand dollar loan. That's right. And and it, and it also used to be, you know, people couldn't buy a home because the interest rates were too high. Mm -hmm. the interest rates can't go any lower. So that's not the issue. And I, I think it's I mean you nailed it. It's people just aren't able to get homes based on all the regulations and, and they're they're gonna add a little more. Hey yeah. Franco. Uh, quick question too is um, this from Chad? Uh, has there been any conversation if there's any retroactive about you know the land contracts over five years or twenty percent of having those be forced to either be converted into notes or just have those be retroactive to this law? Has anything regarding that specific grouping come up? No, no. I think as they're putting this bill together, there's probably going to be some changes to it. Um, but right now, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see anything in there and I don't know about the retroactivity and that would be a, a good point on that five-year rule is, you know, what statute are you looking at? I really think they're going to amend that statute and probably eliminate some of those uh, issues and possibly shorten that time frame. Um, but, uh, you know, so far I, I don't see anything retroactive about it, but again, you know, I'm going to keep monitoring it and kind of see how it's going to play itself out right now. The current statute is still the current statute. So, you know, you do a land contract today, it's, it's the land contract of today. And um, I, I don't know, I, I don't see any retroactive um, possibilities, but it's not over yet. Okay. So, circling back to when we were first talking about what the new rules are for um, a loan or like a land contract, um, you were saying that they have to check uh, and like the utilities have to be up to date, everything has to be up mm -hmm. to date. Are, is it, has it become the case that a, um, a property can basic, basically has to have clear title on it to become a land contract property? Because um, one of the things, when the way, we talk about this all the time, the way these quit claim deeds get like, you know, dealt out like playing cards, you know, yeah. they've got like so much stuff on them. I have one in Indiana that's got a 20 year, oh, it's got a judgment on it um, that doesn't even belong to the house. It belongs to another, you know, property owned by the same company that sold this to me. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the house is in Gary. It's got Hammond code enforcement liens on it that clearly don't belong to the Gary house. Right. Yet it's on there, nevertheless, and I've gotten really um, kind of conflicting views from the title company about whether if I was selling that house right now, I would have to pay those judgments. But whether I do or whether I don't, like my workaround is that I'm, I offered it on a lease option and um, I, I just made the term long so that the judgments will expire, I'm hoping. But I don't even know if I'm doing, you know, if that's even correct. Yeah, that, that judgment's going to last. The lien, the lien is going to last for 10 years. The judgment survives for 20. So that's the kind of the interplay. And, and, you know, I guess it depends on how old that judgment lien is. And I know title companies don't like judgments either. So you might as well look at it as 20 years anyways. So uh, am I correct that a Hammonds code lien on a Gary, Indiana property is something that I would have to deal with or? Is that it, it's against that seller's uh, exact corporate name? Uh, I'll have to check. The exact <laughs> corporate name of the seller who deeded it to me. Right. Yeah, I'll have to look. Yeah, I would assume is that, yeah, if that's who it's against, it'll, it'll follow the land. It'll follow that, that company's name. So, Franco, uh, Gil brought up a good point. As part of the land contract in Ohio, um, I thought I read somewhere, too, as part of the transfer, you would have to give a warranty deed versus a quick claim deed. Is that still on the table as part of this um, 
uh, I guess, law. Yeah, and, and you know, the the interplay between a general warranty deed and a quick claim deed, you know, you're, you're warranting that there's, you know, there could be encumbrances, there could be liens, there could be something else, easements against the property. Um, you know, th those aren't, I, I don't see those fought in court much. Uh, I think the, the bigger issue, again, are going to be these, these liens that pop up on sellers' properties. And those can just follow that company around. Now, what about tax sale properties? Because I know a lot, some title companies don't want to touch those or only after a certain amount of time. Well, it depends. So um, you got to look at the state you're in. Ohio is different from Michigan, which is different from Indiana, because there are different ways of doing tax sales. And Ohio is judicial, so you shouldn't have any issues there. Okay. Um, in Indiana, you've got two ways of doing it. One's judicially, one is through the treasurer's process. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the tax sales happen, that non-judicial side. And the state leaves it up to the purchaser of that tax sale to make sure they give all the notices out to the proper parties. One being that first lien holder on the property, if there is one. If they didn't properly give them notice, that first lien stays on the property. That's why title companies won't touch that. Michigan has the same type of deal. They've got a judicial and non-judicial way. Non-judicial, you have to follow a lot of these different rules. And if you don't, those liens follow that property. Good. So, anything else on Ohio, Gail or Franco? Because um, I'd like to roll over to Indiana as well. Because um, I know Indiana has had some recent changes in regard to the utilities, whether they stick with the property versus uh, the you know the borrower. And then the other thing I read, and I don't know what happened to it, was similar with land contracts. They were trying to put if there was more than like five or ten percent equity in the property, it kind of converts to. Um, almost like a note and just curious what have you seen in Indiana recently yeah you know the utilities have to become a lien same like the water uh, any water bill those water bills even though they sometimes they're not going to show up in a title report because they haven't become liens or they haven't been put on as taxes so sometimes those those liens will be put on as taxes and that's why the taxes go up uh, same thing with a water bill that's outstanding still follows that property so if you look at a standard, you know, homeowner sale where you go to live in the house, you got to get that final water bill. You have to get all those final bills. And that's the big reason. The big reason is there could be a bill outstanding that will not show up in a title report. It won't show up anywhere. So those are the type of issues you're going to see once you start buying properties. Mm -hmm. Some of these things follow the property. Mm -hmm. And eventually they can become liens. They can be attached to, to taxes. And, and they really come out of nowhere. Yes, yeah, so I've noticed in Michigan they do. The water bill does show up in the like in the tax on the tax page. Tax page has taxes and utilities yeah. on it. So I I used to got to complain about my twenty five hundred dollar water bill in Flint, Michigan, and then Chris got a giant water bill. So now nobody gets to complain about anything. This is, it's all about him. And what happens to him? <laughs> How sad it is. It's nine doesn't grand. sound like many good stories. It doesn't sound like good stories. Yeah, it's nine grand. Not it's nothing. Um, <laughs> yeah, ninety five hundred was it? Yeah, I forget. Um, they originally told me it was twenty something thousand. That kind of had me choke a little bit. But um, <laughs> so Franco, you know, with um, you know, in you know, some of these Midwest states and the attorney who I use a lot for a lot of my regular um, bit corporate stuff kind of mentions he sees in probably the next five to 10 years, the possibility called extinction of land contracts, just based on um, where governments are going and moving more to a little more liberal side of things. You know, curious what your opinion is uh, on that as well. Oh, I would agree. I would agree. And you know, you're seeing it today in Ohio, you're seeing, um, you know, a massive change and that is going to continue. Um, because especially if something happens, if something happens in, in Michigan, Ohio is going to take notice, Indiana will take notice. Uh, so once this happens in Ohio, the other states will take notice and kind of look at them a little more. Um, you know, we, we have actually in, in Michigan, really, it's, it's for us, it's, it's one of the easier states because there, there really isn't a lot of, you know, regulation behind it. Um, the issue is whether you want to be able to go through a, a forfeiture or foreclosure 
and that at the time of judgment of forfeiture, the borrower can pay that reinstatement and or wait 90 days and then day 90 pay that reinstatement. In the meantime, they didn't pay the last three months. So guess what? You have to reforfeit again. And so it's strange in Michigan, but it's quicker and there, there isn't really a lot, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of issues going through. Uh, I do believe these land contracts are going to be really looked at in the next couple of years. Um, and five, you know, five years is probably a good point to look at where we are in five years. And I, I think that landscape is going to change quite a bit. Yeah. Pennsylvania is really hostile too towards them. Like I guess until the crash and all these funds got put together and bought all of these, mm -hmm. you know, really distressed little houses and put land contracts on all of them. That's really what's, caused all the issues right now it's been 10 years 11 years uh you know of land contract experience widespread particularly throughout the midwest and people are i mean some people are incredibly successful i i see performing land contracts that are 10 11 years old you know people yeah. are still paying and doing well so i mean they've definitely been such a help to people who otherwise can't qualify to buy a house. So right. and that, and that I think is a big difference from uh, the seventies. And now you have, you know, these land contracts that were giving borrowers a lower interest rate, or at least working a little better than the traditional lender, but they're still able to get a home. Nowadays, you just have people who just can't get that loan that can't qualify land contracts come out. Now they say, well, you shouldn't have given them a land contract. Well, you can, you can say that about cars. You can say that about anything. You know, yeah. then you, you you just won't have a market for that type of product. Wait, Franco, is the law also on owner occupied only? Um, you mean like a commercial? Uh, yeah, this is this is just owner occupied. Absolutely. Okay, that's what I'm just curious. Like, you know, in Ohio, if you had somebody who wanted to use it in a rental, and I had it as, uh, you know, say I foreclosed on a property, and I didn't want to write this, you know guy a note who's going to use it as a rental because of the cost of foreclosure could i write him a land contract and you know does it have to fall all these regulations or because it's kind of a commercial non owner occupied loan it's kind of back to similar like with a note almost um you kind of don't have to play by all the rules yeah you just got to be careful with that commercial side if, if you're doing it on the commercial side that borrower has to be renting that property out so you're you're basically you know taking money from a landlord then those you know those rules won't apply Okay. Interesting. So, so uh, kind of brain twisted to think, okay, just have the borrower sign it, set up an LLC for the borrower and then have him <laughs> do it and stuff. But <laughs> yeah, it's always, it's always the intention of the money. It's not so much the, the structure of it. And that's what my other attorney tells me too. God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so Franco, um, and if people have questions, again, feel free to ask. One of the things in Michigan that I've seen recently with laws too, because I almost tried to play this card um, and it was going to go unsuccessful was I was going to allow a property in Michigan to go to tax sale and collect the overage. But then when I did some research, I read that the overage in Michigan actually doesn't go to the first position lender, the county or city or state takes everything on the overage. Um, but I see that's also being challenged. Are you familiar with that law at all? Yeah, only a little bit though, and that's that's the only part that I know about is that you know you're not getting anything from a tax sale. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can you can wait it out, but you know, again, those tax sales, I would assume that was a judicial tax sale. Your best bet is to get in there and at least mm -hmm. you know see how much those taxes are and if they're worth. And if they're not, um, you know, you'll you'll be you'll be defaulted out. So that's one thing you just kind of got to be careful with. But yeah, overall, you know, you're you're not going to get much in a tax sale. Yeah, because yeah, you know, I was bought the note very low, and it had about seven grand in taxes. But the house was worth like twenty grand. I'm like, why should I pay the seven grand in taxes? Why don't I just go like go to sale, and if it sells for ten grand, I'll get three grand off the back end um, and make a few bucks. But then when I was talking with the county, they were very they're very coy with what they're saying. They said there is no overage, and I'm like, what's that mean? They said the tax sale gets collected by the county. That's all they would say, and. Yeah. Um, I have never heard of that because does that mean also if there wasn't a mortgage on there that the that the owner of the house would not get the overage also? It's nothing. They claim that they have so many. Like how can they steal your equity in the house? Like these, 
well, it's get, these it's, are public servants. They're so principled. These public servants, you know, about protecting consumers. Like, how do they get to steal the money above and beyond what's owed to them? Well, anyone? <laughs> yeah, you know, let me research that issue a little more, and let me get you something. I'll shoot you an email, Chris, either tomorrow or on Monday. That's an interesting issue. You know, I've I've heard that before about the the, the overages. There there there's there isn't. So well, you wonder well, how much if somebody came out and bid ten for. You know, seven yeah. taxes. It, what you know, that's it, yeah. I'll, I'll take a look what, at that. What they yeah, say it can't because, be normal because there's like a big guru who's been teaching tax overage strategies. You know, <laughs> where you find the people and you collect the overage for them and keep a piece of it yourself. Like he's like going crazy with this class. Yeah. So when I spoke to them, what they said is because ninety nine percent of properties sell for less than the tax sale value. It's yeah, but that's no reason to make a rule that if they sell for more, you don't give the money back. It's right? well, it's being challenged. It's being challenged in a few. I would hope uh, so. I think it's in the Michigan Supreme Court um, because somebody, um, some companies, I think, I think it's some of the bigger lenders are challenging it because they're claiming that sometimes they may not have been notified, and then you mm. know it goes to sale, and it's uh, you know it's being challenged because I'm. It's the only state I know of that I think that it was ludicrous that, you know, if somebody loses their property to tax sale, that any overage, you know, doesn't go to, you know, everything again, just goes right to the, uh, that jurisdiction. So, um, <laughs> one, of, one of our listeners says they steal your money in taxes in the first place. Yeah, so. now, now they want the rest. <laughs> Uh, so there was a question from Sylvia. Why do utility bills stay with the property, whether it's a note or CFD, and it doesn't matter if you foreclose, you still have to pay them like taxes, correct? Yeah, that, and again, it's, it's based on the lien. And, and of course, when you're done with the sheriff's, you are the owner of that property. That water bill will always stay with that property. It doesn't matter. And you say CFD or note and mortgage, it's whoever owns it. Yeah. So, and I, and I, I know some people get worried about like CFDs and they're like, oh, well, if there's water and utility bills, those are going to come to you. And I'm like, it doesn't matter whether it's a note or CFD because you're foreclosing or forfeiting, getting that property back. They don't get wiped, you know. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah, and that's it. With the foreclosure, you're, you know, I guess you're not paying them right away, but you're going to pay them later. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty amazed that um, utility comp companies allow or water companies specifically allow these massive water bills to accrue. And apparently they'll let the person pay just a really small amount to turn the water back on. Mm -hmm. And their excuse is, well, we can't have people living without water, but the electric company will turn your electricity off. They won't turn it back on unless you pay them the entire balance. So like, why don't they, well, I know this is not, you're, you're not running the company. But like, why don't they make them pay the full balance when it's little, you know, before it's twenty four hundred dollars or ninety five hundred dollars? Yeah, it's, like, that, it's, it's that. It's exactly what you said. It's habitability. You know, you have to have water. And again, yes, utilities are a little different. You need those too, especially when it's cold out. Uh, yeah, but, Michigan. Yeah. Water. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had a funny interaction about my twenty five hundred dollar water bill in Flint, <laughs> Michigan. So. Um, I, I wanted to show them the land contract and how, uh, when the woman first defaulted, the land contract said that she became a tenant, uh, cause they made a big thing about how if she was a tenant, the water, the water bill would follow her. But since it was a land contract, it's, it's all mine. So I wanted to show them land contract where it says, as soon as she defaults, she becomes a tenant. I said, look, she became a tenant <laughs> back then. And they actually said, had you like brought that to us when it first happened and made that point and switched it to like a landlord situation that it would have stopped accruing in my name because this was years before I even bought the land contract so yeah. I didn't get to do that but would that do you think that that would work I doubt it um, <laughs> highly <laughs> There's something just really incredible. So, you know, we're predatory lenders, supposedly, but, you know, we're getting sort of like stuck with these massive water bills and stuff and tax bills and, and everything else. Like how, this is my question to you, Franco, how are we the bad guys? Yeah, no, you're, you're not. You're, you're the ones that, you know, and, and I've had some water department uh, representatives tell me that, well, you guys caused the problem. Well, that's, how is that possible? 
You know, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but th these are the times. These are the times. They don't want to burden the borrower. They don't want to burden the tenant. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's just what it is right now. And, you know, just a few years ago, even as attorneys, us going to hearings for foreclosures, you know, we were the bad guys too. So every time we'd go to court, they would pick apart everything in our file to make sure every single thing was done correctly. And we're talking, you know, grammatical errors. So it's, it's a tough landscape. Um, we're, we're weeding through it. Hey, Franco actually kind of jump on something that Gail mentioned about, you know, land contracts that it says, hey, if you don't pay, you turn into a tenant. In any of the states you practice in, is that actually viable? No. Where? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's that you write the contract and then there's the law and you yeah know. yeah you do the you have to do the release and then if they stay there they're considered month to month if you accept payments but uh now it's 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 not gonna what, what i've had an attorney do in another state was tell the borrower that well based on the agreement you become a tenant so here you go sign this versus mm -hmm. just going through the forfeiture process and you know they're like okay we understand because that's what the contract said and they signed it and you know we end up working the cash for keys deal and stuff and i was sitting there thinking actually you know maybe i should have all my attorneys just say hey this is what the contract says and you know, start with that saying hey do you want to sign the cancellation but what happened on this instance was you know and why his contracts say you know if you stop you become a tenant and your your rent is going to be like 300 bucks a month well, the going rent is probably like 900. So they think, okay, I'll be a yeah. tenant forever for $300. Um, sure. Not realizing that um, that could occur. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good play to say that to the borrower about the payments. You know, Hey, if you're, if you're looking to lease this, it's going to be 900 is your payments 400, you know, you're gonna have to work with me because eventually we're, you're going to have to be forfeited or foreclosed. And then, then what's going to happen. So I mean, you can use that as a negotiation tactic, but uh, not the fact that it's, it's going to convert. Okay. So this is what happened to me with a contract. So you, we all know the standard contract has all these clauses that we've been mm -hmm. talking about. So I happen to be in a place in a state where the cancellation process involved um, the borrower had to miss two payments and then you would send a 45 day notice and they had 45 days to reinstate. And then um, if they didn't, the, there was no hearing required. The, the um, land contract was automatically canceled as a matter of law, just like that's it. You just let them know it's happened. And then uh, there's a five day eviction period by law. So I had the standard, um, you know, people become a tenant after they've missed a payment. So I was like, well, aren't they a tenant? And I'm like, no, you have to do the 45 day thing because that's mandated. But then also mandated is the five day eviction period. But we get to that part and they go, well, your contract says 30 days. So you're gonna have to give them 30 days. So I was like, I thought we weren't going by the contract. <laughs> it was like, now we're going by the contract. Yeah, you're going in and out of that contract. Yeah, so it seems like, it's like whatever gives more latitude to the borrower is what we're going to do. Like whether that's in your contract or it's in the law. Do you? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if the, if the contract differs from the law, the, the law is going to win. So, and then the, the flip side is in Michigan, it's a 15 day period for default. But if your contract says 30, you have to stick with 30. Right. So I mean, they're, they're going to look at the, you know, uh, what that interplay is going to look like. Yeah, every, every state that I work with has that at least that 30 day period. Michigan's got 15. Um, and then again, you got to go through the forfeiture process, get that contract forfeited. Then at that point, you can tell that borrower if you want to be a month to month, start paying. Yeah. So, Franco, does your office do the legal work for um, tax certificates in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio? No, we don't. Uh, Indiana, I, I'd be pretty scared of doing. And same with Michigan. It's just there's there's a, so much involved in getting those sales done. That so it's much not, yeah, It's not, I, not a real house. We bought house. a property in January in a commissioner's sale in mm -hmm. uh, Indiana. I cannot believe, you know, you have like the initial like, euphoria, like, oh, I got such a good deal on that thing. At this point, I feel like, a vampire is just draining all the blood out of me. Like the cost 
the emotional <laughs> aspect. So first, you know, the notification process, and then yeah. they have 120 days for a commissioner sale to redeem the property. Yeah. Then when you apply, if no one redeems, you apply for the, you petition the court for the tax deed. You have to re-notify all the same people. That's right. Now it's 30 days. And then hopefully then, you know, then they want you to do a quiet title. Exactly. That was going to be my point too. Is and re-notify no, all the same people. Yeah. No underwriter will touch it. They'll look at the case. They'll see tax sale. Okay. Or oh, there's a lien here. They don't, they don't care what kind of lien it is. Sorry. You got to clean this up. You file a quiet title action. You're, you'll probably be successful. But the ones where you have to worry about are those first lien holders that have actually a mortgage on the property. Yeah. Those don't always get quieted. Um, yeah, what happens in a quiet title process if someone comes forward and challenges or exerts a claim? The party that challenges has the burden of proving, you know, the, the reason that their interest shouldn't be quieted. So if you have a first lien holder, they're the ones that are going to fight usually. And when they fight, the biggest argument is notice. We never receive notice. All right, burden shifts. Now the person who owns the property has to show they went through all of those, you know, regulations and processes and they're missing one notice mm -hmm. gone subject to that lien. Hey, hey Franco. Yeah. So jump back a little bit on CFDs and you know, <laughs> we talk about, you know, them and how it's looking like eventually, you know, they're going to be continue to be problematic. So of course, you know, one of the things people may look for is converting them to land contracts, which is, I know something you do, uh, cause I, you know, just had you do one for me. Um, now, question that Chad brought up too, and it's a good question, is if you convert a land contract to a traditional note, will the usury rates apply? And do you have to qualify that borrower through with a registered mortgage loan officer with the ability to repay and all that stuff? That rule in, in our states is three loans, and that follows Dodd-Frank. So you've got your three loan rule. If, you, if you're going to do those three times you know, in that calendar year, mm -hmm. And, you know, we still prep those documents, but you obviously have to get um, that mortgage loan originator, originator to go and do the other documents, you know, yep. all your loan applications, the 4506, all of that. So mm -hmm. just watch out for that. You can convert them, but now it's considered an origination. Okay. And so when you do that, um, when you convert it, technically you're canceling the land contract, so the new note could include those costs, or you could bump up the UPB to include any costs for, you know, the conversion itself. Like if you know legal was X amount of dollars and originator was Y amount, you could add that to um, legally or not. Yeah, well, you, what you're looking at is marketability. So you're releasing that land contract, and now to get yourself in a traditional note and mortgage, and then we've done this because it's required. You need a purchase agreement, and then you'll need the deed. So yes. that borrower is basically buying that property. So yeah. if that pro property is a market value of 50 and the purchase agreement is for 150, you're going to have problems down the road. Yeah. Um, you know, it, that's the issue you're going to have. So if the property is valued at 50 and all of your charges, maybe they equal 52, 53, you're probably in good shape. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how you can build those costs in. So um, that's how you can add them. You don't technically add them. You just do it based on the market. Yeah. I mean, mo the most of the ones I've done is might have been 20 grand. Property is actually worth like 30,000. Um, yep. So it's, you know, roll it in. And, um, cool. and one of the other questions that I hear varying back and forth too is in some of these contracts is can you include the servicing costs to the borrower and have them responsible for it? Your mortgage is going to show that if, if servicing costs are allowed to be put on there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I believe those aren't allowed if they're not in the mortgage. Okay. But um, if you're writing a new, if you're originating a new one and it's written in the mortgage, then you could have them be responsible? Yeah, you can. Um, it has to be disclosed. So okay. make sure you know that that's happening. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Christina, gosh, sounds like CFDs can be quite problematic. Uh, yeah, our, our chat role here is just a massive of twisted fury and indignation. <laughs> now, now, question I'd ask Franco is, you know, an investor, um, you know, and I 
try and stay out of Ohio personally um, now. <laughs> but, you know, Physically some, and in business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, for people looking and, you know, they see a tape of CFDs in Ohio, should they almost now just treat them all as notes or how should somebody look at if they still want to buy CFDs or should they just stay away or what, what, would, your, what would your recommendation be? Well, again, you're looking at if this bill is going to be retroactive and if it's not, you know, treat it like it's a CFD. Treat okay. a CFD like a CFD until that ruling comes out and if it's not retroactive, then you know when that day starts yep. and if you've got tape before that date, you should be okay. If it is retroactive or if there's you know, some issues regarding some of the provisions uh, mm -hmm. are retroactive, you're not going to look at it as a note. You're looking at it as a lease. Because even with a note and mortgage, you as a lender, you're not responsible for, for all of these taxes and, yeah. and insurance of the, bar the borrowers. They own the property. So you're looking at it as an actual lease. So are you willing to be that kind of land? I mean, even with a CFD, you're, you're technically a landlord. You're still taking payments. And, yeah. But as a, a lease landlord, you're, you're a lot more maintenance involved. Yeah. Now, wasn't there also something in Ohio about uh, strictly on notes regarding, you know, whether or not you need a license and you invest in seconds, you have to do proper notification? Yeah. I know there's opinions back and forth on that. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's very gray. Yeah, there were a lot of bills that were passed at the end of last year with a governor that was leaving office. So it's pretty rare to do that, to sign that many bills as, as the governor passed at the end of his term. <laughs> and uh, the, the ones that he did... The first specific one was second liens. If you own a second lien, you must send what they consider a pre-collection letter that tells that borrower, you know, here's how much is owed. You have the right to an attorney. You can file bankruptcy if you'd like. You can file 7-7 seven, seven or 13. And uh, it's just, it's an extra added letter that's really unnecessary. Um, so that's the first thing is, is the second lien letter. You have to make sure of that. Uh, the other provision is the uh, licensure requirement through the uh, Department of Financial Institutions. And that one gets uh, a little gray. You know, we don't, we don't know what, it, what the state tried to do. The state was supposed to give us guidance, and it stated that they were going to give the public guidance regarding the licensure requirement. It basically added servicers as an entity that needed to get a license uh, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And the problem is you guys actually become servicers when you get the note, right? Cause you're looking at taxes, you're looking at escrow payments. Um, if you do anything a servicer does when you hold that note and mortgage, you have to get a license. So I know a lot of times you guys don't give the file right away to the servicer. You kind of work the file a little bit yourselves. Uh, the minute you do that, you, you're going to have to get it. So, um, Right now, the NMLS is in charge. Uh, are you guys familiar with that website? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty painful. Um, but there's... I'm not trying to get a license on there. <laughs> well, you got, it's, it's under the, the mortgage section, and it's 1322.07. You click on there, and it looks like it's for servicers. But as you dig a little deeper, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of gray. So, again, I, I've still recommended as a, a note owner and, and purchaser of notes and mortgages you should probably get the license until this thing gets squared away. You don't want to be down the road, that test case where you're in front of court, you're in an appeal court decision. Now you're in a Supreme court decision, your name's on it. You don't want any part of that. So that's why I've advised that. I mean, that advice could be wrong in the future with, with guidance, but I, I can't be saying that now without that type of guidance. What's a cost to get a license? Any idea? Um, I have not seen that. I know there's a couple of investors that have started that process. Um, but I have not seen what that final bill would end up being. You mentioned Kentucky. Uh, and it's my understanding with Kentucky. Yeah, I forgot to say that you operate in Kentucky. Did yeah. I say that? Did I mention that? I just, <laughs> Kentucky is dead to me. It's not even on the map. There's just a, like a big empty space. It's my understanding that contract for deeds you're fine with, but in Kentucky, if you're going to buy notes, basically you more almost need to be like a, a lending institution with a, a credit line of up to a million dollars is my understanding. Is that correct? Yeah, and you could have a you know a, a big hedge fund that gets you that million dollars, but you also have a bond. You have a lot of other requirements, a lot of yearly requirements, um, and it's it's just not worth it. There's there's 
too much money involved in doing it. And yes, that's what they're trying, Kentucky tried to do. And that's what they successfully done. They only want institutional lenders there. That's where we get our work. We get most of our work from in Kentucky from institutional lenders and we still don't get that many. Um, so it's, it's a tough state to get into uh, when you're looking at notes and mortgages. And then on the CFD side, excuse me, on the CFD side in Kentucky, you have to foreclose those. There is no forfeiture, nothing. It's, it's foreclosure, and that's it. So that's how, another, how expensive is it? It's similar to our other states. So you're looking. I'd budget between five and seven thousand dollars. <laughs> Yikes! Um, did you say when? Do we know when that ruling about the retroactivity of? No. Now the the bill the, the bill is going through its normal process um, through the state legislature. So I'm I'm monitoring it to kind of see what gets changed, what gets put in. Uh, there is no discussion about retroactivity. Some of the provisions uh, may lend you to believe that it's going to apply uh, right. to contracts before a certain date. But for now, until that bill passes, it's you know it's status quo. So Franco, you've opened up Illinois too. Yes. I have avoided Illinois always as a note person because of you know what I was told were very kind of draconian laws about note and you know being a note owner mm -hmm. debt owner there um, how difficult is the licensing process there for first of all we do have to have a license right to be yeah owned right. debt in Illinois that's your problem yeah, that's your probably your big problem in Illinois. We we haven't found many issues in Illinois. I know people want to talk about Cook County. You know, Cook County, you're going to get issues with with high water bills that come out of nowhere. And we have that issue here in Cleveland, <laughs> too, in Cuyahoga County, in Ohio. You get these massive water bills. I had one client that came to me. They had a twenty five thousand dollar water bill, and I'm that's looking at it. One of those. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The, the previous person in the property um, paid the last bill like the year pre previous. So I called the city and I said, how do you get $25,000 worth in a year? There was, was there a leak? No, we confirmed there's no leak. And then eventually it took about another year and they finally dropped all charges. And it was like, well, it didn't make any sense. So that's what I see in Illinois, Cook County specifically, that water bill issue, transferring properties, getting all of those documents together. Otherwise, for closing, uh, we haven't seen many issues. You know, We haven't seen that timeline go to two years. Um, when a borrower files for mediation or ask for mediation, that of course is going to extend the life of the foreclosure. It's going to do that everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the licensure requirement, yeah, that, that is, it's required. Um, I believe it's a little over $5,000 to get that license. And I'm not familiar with whether it's annually or if it's a one-time fee. Again, that NM, NMLS website <laughs> has the exact provision in there of where you need to go. It's similar to Kentucky on the requirements. Uh, right. but a lot lower in, on the price tag. So there's a bond also involved? Yes, there's a bond as well. You know, it's really interesting because there's so much misinformation about this. I've mm -hmm. had people, so when I asked about it, uh, and I asked an attorney before you were in Illinois, and mm -hmm. they told me they wanted like a $5,000 retainer to even just like get me the license. That didn't even involve paying, you know, anything to the state itself. But I, yet I just heard you know, a very prominent guru like today on a webinar say it's like 150 bucks and you just pay it. I think there's like confusion between like a foreign entity registration yeah. and a license. That can be it. That, that's what I thought it was. When you say that price, that's about yeah. the, the price for foreign licensure. I recommend that for anybody in any state that's not their state is get that foreign license is very cheap. Just you might yeah. as well. Um, no, that, that's what that sounds like. But no, Illinois has a, has a specific um, licensure requirement. Cuyahoga County, if you're not what, a foreign entity, don't they whack you or fine you or something like that too? If you um... Yeah, they, they do. And a lot of the sheriff's um, bid forms yeah. now require you to put the registration number of your Ohio LLC. Not your LLC, your Ohio one. So... You know, that's starting to be the requirement now. And I know we saw that in some counties. And I, I actually talked to uh, Dave Clipp, our senior foreclosure attorney, and he said, yeah, I think this is the standard share form because I can't believe they're actually putting this on here. So if you don't have that foreign you know, license in Ohio, get one. It's not that cheap. We do that for people in Ohio. Uh, it's a very seamless process, very cheap process. 
other states like Michigan and Indiana, you need to get an actual brick and mortar company to do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. I use, you know, registered agents that kind of will, you know, let you, cause you need one in most of these states when you register as a Ford agent and stuff like that, they have the brick and mortar in there and stuff. Now, speaking of kind of, you know, we talk a lot about licensing and Illinois, we talked about Kentucky, we talk about, we talk about registering out of state uh, foreign entities. Is there any type of like debt collection license or any other type of in licenses in either Michigan, Indiana? I mean, we talked about Ohio that, investors should have or should really start look into yeah that, that's actually my next um project and putting that together for you all um certain states require them certain don't illinois actually does have a debt collector's license it's whether you guys would be considered debt collectors in that state so that's why i need to fine tune exactly every state has one mm -hmm. um so i just i need to fine tune that research and, and get that out to you guys but right now I'm not too familiar with that, just knowing that they're, you know, each state does have one. Okay. Um, let's see, any other questions we have coming through? Um, one thing I'll mention, Franco, uh, you know, and Gail actually and I, it was comical, we were actually going to record a podcast today about um, how we'd like to strangle attorneys. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> But, um, you know, and I think one of the biggest things with attorneys is from an investor standpoint is, you know, being able to get an attorney to respond or get an email. And, you know, people, I think it's the expectation factor. And I think it would be good for you just to kind of share a few minutes of, you know, the expectations because, you know, in today's world of everyone having one of these things, they think people can respond quickly and, you know, you might be in court one day or whatnot. Um, and, you know, just the overall like for forfeiture or foreclosure process, you know, when you read what they have on, you know, Fannie Mae for their guidelines and stuff, I mean, that's like the sh most shrunk down version. And a lot of times they don't include like serv the, serving the person and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, that process as well as just kind of the day to day and expectations um, people, sh you know, should expect. Yeah. First on, on the, the day to day expectation, you know, I'm, I'm one where I, I like to di digest my emails overnight. So you pro if you get a response that day, it's, it's probably a simple answer, but other times it's going to be the next day. Um, you know, I, I don't like to let it last that long uh, within a couple of days, but um, you know, our expectation is within 24 to 48 hours, a client's going to get a response. And it's all that's unusual, by the way. I'm sorry? I, that's unusual. I mean, Gail or anyone else can chime in, but if I get a response within a week from attorney, I'm satisfied. <laughs> Yeah, ho hopefully you're not getting that from us, but I mean, I know there's, we, the, the point of our firm is to make sure the client is taken care of. Now, if it's multiple questions on multiple days, then it might extend a little bit further. Um, but I mean, I think Chris, you've seen it, you know, we've been pretty responsive at, at you know, getting you answers you need and getting you on the yep. phone for conference calls. It, it, it's, 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 a lot, it's still a line of business for us. You know, it's not, we have good attorneys, we are good attorneys, um, but on the other side, we still, we're running a business. And we have customer clients that you know need that guidance. So we try to make that turnaround 24 to 48 hours. If it does extend a little further, it's probably an issue that we would need a little more uh, on there. Um, I'm actually surprised how often I have heard from you on a Sunday. <laughs> you know, every once in a while, if the kids are playing in the backyard, I'm, I figure, I figure like he needs a break from the kids. He's locked <laughs> himself in a room somewhere. <laughs> no, those kids are great, but no, I mean, I, I, I don't mind it, especially with something I can answer pretty quickly and, and you know, uh, pop off an email. Um, I've mean, got my secret, but I'm not going to share it with when I know, when I get Franco. So. <laughs> 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 but you know, on the other side of it, the um, the disclosure of those costs is very difficult. So that those Fannie Mae fees are just attorney's fees. When you're looking at costs for courts, they're all over the place. Uh, Ohio, you don't know where you're going to be. I, I believe um, Sandusky County is a thousand dollars to file a foreclosure, a court cost. So it's it's hard to tell what county is going to do what. That's why we've always told people budget between five and seven thousand on your attorney's fees and costs because that $2,000 gap is where you're going to get hit with costs. And, um, you know, Michigan is, you'll see it's obviously the cheaper of all the states. It's non-judicial. The costs are more in front of you and you kind of know what's going on. Uh, but when you're looking at Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio, that's why those costs range between five and seven. Uh, so I feel that at least gives everybody a good window of, all right, top end, I'm putting 7,000 into this, this case. 
Some states are recoverable, some states they're not. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, you'll have to find an interplay on that too. But again, what does recoverable mean? Are you going to actually go after the borrower for those fees and costs? You know, not usually. So um, you just want to make sure you, I guess, if you want that property back um, yourself, you're going to want to put as many of those costs on that bid to make sure you can put the full bid so you get that property back. Um, yeah, that's kind of how it works. So another, another question I had is, you know, I've worked with you now for a few years and other people on here as well. You know, I know there's, you handle the foreclosure debt, Tony handles her um, bankruptcy side. And then, you know, I see Katie and Molly a lot as well. And I think Katie does the demand letters or forfeitures and Molly is on the foreclosure side. Is that how it is? Or just That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So Katie's taking care of all her forfeiture work and, and it's exactly right. Molly's taking care of the, the foreclosure work. And then on the Illinois side, uh, we actually have a separate uh, side for our Illinois foreclosures that's separate from our other four states. The idea was um, we tried to build our collections department with the Illinois side as well. So that's kind of why we want to, how our firm is built on where collections is located and where bankruptcy is located. Collections is in my office. So that's why it felt a little better to keep the Illinois side of it, at least in my office. And with Illinois, everything is e-filing. So we're not worried about having, um, you know, staff have to prepare within the state of Illinois to actually send paperwork from Illinois with a wedding signature. It just has to be reviewed by that attorney. That attorney does have to have put additional signature on it that they reviewed it, but everything's done through electronic means. So that's, you know, that's kind of how we play the firm. But yeah, Katie does the forfeiture. She's doing a pretty good job. You know, we're picking up a little bit, so she's a little bit overwhelmed, but we've got help on the way. And, you know, we've got the good processes in place in the foundation there. So, um, you know, we're trying to, trying to keep that uh, as good quality as possible. The other question I was going to ask is just went through it today. Um, Ohio is, is Ohio the only state that you represent where if you go to do a forfeiture, or you go to court, you actually have to have a personal representative for the company that can't be somebody like you have an attorney there, but my entity has to have somebody there. So either I have to fly out to Ohio or, you know, find a, find a guy on the street corner to pay him a hundred bucks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's street corner Ohio. I mean that that's Ohio's tough in that way that you do need a representative. I've tried in the past putting affidavits together and filing them with courts, and then we were getting courts continuing hearings because they wanted a person or just dismissing it, saying you know what, there's no person here. We don't look at affidavits. We want people. Yeah. So we've made that kind of a blanket, like you know what, you got to have a rep there. Um, if you got a property manager or somebody that's around the property that can show up at these hearings, they have to say whether the borrower defaulted. So yes, Ohio out of all of our states is, is the only one that does do that, does have that requirement. It's amazing what a hundred bucks will get you on Craigslist. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I was going to say, Ohio is like that kid in school who's just trying to be annoying. Just trying to be. Yeah, it's tough. So and, and you know, too, you, you have to watch out too because judges are going to ask questions for these um, property managers, whether they truly are property managers. And they say, well, no, I'm just here for the hearing. You know, you got to be careful with that because then you're going to, there you, they will be called in at that point. So it's like a, it's like a green card marriage. They want to know if you're really married. <laughs> you're really the property manager. Are you a guy from Craigslist? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what happens with evictions here on, on standard leases. It's, it's property manager driven. Property manager knows that property best. They deal with that tenant the most. They're the ones that are going to you know, have the most knowledge behind that case. So we see that a lot on, on, on that end. Um, but we're seeing too now in post foreclosure evictions, we normally didn't have anybody appear from the bank because they bought the property back and the borrower lives there. There's no rent. So it's considered non-color of title. So all we're trying to do is remove the borrower or remove that borrower from the, the premises. And now judges are requiring a representative to appear. And we asked one judge, what do you want us to ask the bank? They took the property back. Here's a sheriff deed. And they just want them to come to court and say that. So it, it's getting strange, but uh, Ohio is, is, you know, they do want to see representatives there to testify. Um you know, running late on time and stuff. So ask anyone out there if they have any last second and last minute questions uh, for Franco. And you'll never uh, see him again. <laughs> <laughs> I will do this again gladly. No so one of the things I'll mention it while people start putting some questions in. So you kind of, you know, we talked about a lot of different states and so forth and so on, but pretty much from the moment of default of a borrower 
through the entire cycle, whether it's a CFD or note in the states we talked about, you basically ham, ha handle the whole gamut. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and even on the collection side, people have second liens. You know, you, you don't always have to foreclose. You can, you can file a lawsuit for breach of contract and we can garnish their wages. Uh, so we do that as well. Uh, but yeah, anything real estate related, you know, we, we do it. We do it at our firm. I think we do it pretty good. And, and you know, I, I think with our, the quality of the way that it is now, um, you know, we have good people in, in the right places. And also, you know, on the flip side too, um, you know, origination or I'll call it more like, um, you know, land closing side where if you need to, you know, write a CFD, write a loan modification or write a new mortgage and note, um, you handle all that aspect as well. Yeah. All doc preparation, no matter what it is on the real estate side, we can handle that. Uh, converting the land contract to note and mortgage. Um, even, even down to closings, an actual closing, uh, you know, we have a title company that we work with that handles all the title side. We handle the doc preparation side. And again, it's, it's sort of that one-stop shop where if you're looking to close, you know, we can handle that as well. Well, it looks like a lot of questions got answered. So um, thank you, Franco. I don't know if there's anything, uh, you know, you want to give people your contact information, how they can reach out to you. Do you, have a, do you have a closing statement, counselor? <laughs> Uh, you know, our, our firm, I think, is a little unique in the fact that if you want a foreclosure done, you usually go to the foreclosure mill, you go to those big foreclosure firms, same with collections, same with bankruptcy. Uh, you know, we, we are a little, we're a little unique in that we are smaller in, in size, but we, we can handle the gamut. I mean, we can really take real estate all the way from default to bankruptcy to foreclosure sale all the way to collections. So I, I think we're a little unique and um, I, I think we, we hope to grow that side of, of that and, and market that a little, little more uh, because I think, I think with that unique process, um, I, I think people do enjoy that. I know you can't say this, Franco, but I will. People do not use a foreclosure mill. They just run it right through the gamut. And I've had three notes that were run through that process. And mm -hmm. there was so many issues with them that my attorney had to clean everything up on. So... <laughs> just FYI. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Frank, uh, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah. Okay. You I don't have to share. You handle commercial as well. Sylvia says. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, anything on the commercial side, we can probably talk more on the commercial side regarding Cognovit notes and how that's changing the landscape, but you know, we can probably save that for another time. But yes, uh, anything on the commercial side, uh, we do handle that as well. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Chris was asking, how do people get in touch with you? Um, I, I, can you see my screen or is that a, is it just uh, my, hold on, let me see if I can <laughs> me allow you to share your screen. Um, so I made you host. So if you go down the bottom, click share, I think then you can. And we're sharing my screen. Screen uh, one. Share. Okay, there we are. Not sure why this is still here. Aww. <laughs> we see the Notre Dame. Notre Dame is what oh, we see. I got a picture of that. Yeah. Wow. I got the website up. You guys don't see that? Wow. I don't know. <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> How bad is it? <laughs> All right, well, we've got, a, we've got a, a Strongsville, Ohio office and a Loveland, Ohio office. Um, you can contact me at, at 440-209-6495 and uh, my email, franco.barilli at sotillianbarilli.com, uh, website, sotillianbarilli.com, so you can you know, reach us out there. But again, if you want to reach me, my phone's good too. Again, 440-209-6495. Yep, and we'll put it in the uh, YouTube link as well as in the show notes for the podcast as well, so for people uh, to reach out. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Thank Thanks. you so much, Franco. It's been great. Thank you, Franco. Thank you. I appreciate Enjoy it. Your family vacay. <laughs> yes, I think we're due. We're due soon. So, mo yes, most importantly, when are you on vacay so I know so I can go <laughs> that so we We're looking you. at the uh, at the end of July, the week of the 22nd of July. We'll be off for a week, but you know, I'm I'm a take your computer kind of guy. I've only been able not to take my computer on a couple occasions where there's no Wi-Fi, but we've got Wi-Fi where we're going, so uh, I'll still be active. Yeah, I've, I've got an attorney who's wife is uh, 
having the baby on Monday. So I've crammed down, crammed them down this week with all the stuff to get everything done. Cause he's like, I'm out next week. I'm like, okay, I'm shooting stuff all night long. And so, yeah, it's he called me today laughing. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. Well, good night, everybody. I'm going to log out. Gonna check off. And again, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of good deeds, note investing podcast with Franco Barilli from Tillian Barilli. And as always, uh, Feel free to leave us a comment on iTunes or Stitcher and go out and do some good deeds. Thank you all.